What a most exceptional and alert group of primates. <laughs> Just <laughs> phenomenal to see you all. Now, as a prelude to what I want to talk about, I need you to gather some information on one another. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do for the next 20 seconds is turn to someone near you, not necessarily someone you know, and perhaps it's even better if you don't know them, and Look at them carefully and touch them, preferably touch their skin, but do not talk to them. For the next 10 or 20 seconds, you bloggers, hands off the keyboards. No talking. Yeah, don't look at me. Now, I would guess that some of you didn't do that this morning to someone else. <laughs> because in the modern world, often we get up, our cell phones ring, you check your IM. We don't observe each other. We don't touch one another. This morning, I would like to take you back to a time when we did more of these things and try to understand where we came from in the first several million years of our evolution before we became so uh, incredibly electronically connected and automated. Now, primates are, as you just observed yourself, remarkably observant kinds of animals. We inspect one another intently. We learn from one another through observation. And what I'm going to talk to you a lot about today is we touch one another. Now, primates are extraordinary, or at least unusual, among mammals in that our main sense is the sense of vision. This is the sense on which we depend for most of our information gathering. But second to that, and really very close in importance, is the sense of touch. And equal to that is hearing. And then far below that in relative importance is the sense of smell. Compared to your dog, your sense of smell is extremely inferior and really doesn't tell you very much about the environment. Now, if we look at the human brain, what we see is that there is a very large amount of cortical real estate, as we might say, devoted to in receiving information from our eyes. So there's a big part of the brain that receives visual information from our eyes. And a very large area devoted to receiving information from our sense of touch. Now, human skin is extraordinary. And I've written about this at great length because human skin is something like the rest of our bodies we take entirely for granted, but we don't know very much about it. And it's there for all to see. Human skin is mostly naked, extremely sensitive, especially in some areas. It can become very sweaty. It comes in a natural range of colors. And it's something that we use as a canvas for expressing ourselves in various cultural ways, a truly unique modality among mammals. And the skin is remarkable because if we look at this diagram of the skin, a little schematic diagram, from the top to the bottom, it's just a few millimeters, a sixteenth of an inch thick, an eighth of an inch in some parts of the body, not very much. A very tough exterior that helps to prevent you from getting scraped too much, 
prevents lots of things from, uh, from coming into the skin, excess water and so forth. And then all of these different layers here that, that regenerate constantly to keep your skin uh, basically fresh and constantly uh, presenting a new face to the environment. We gather an enormous amount of information from our environment through our skin. And some of the most sensitive skin on our bodies, as you just found out in your exploration, is the skin of the hand, which is consummately sensitive, exquisitely equipped with a variety of different types of sensory nerve endings that detect pain and deep touch and temperature and send that information back to our brain. Now, different parts of the body are represented in different proportions in this sensory part of our brain. This little guy is often referred to as the sensory homunculus. And it shows us the little person. The hands are disproportionately represented in this area of of real estate on the surface of our brains because we gather so much information from our hands. Our lips and tongue, extremely sensitive. If you touched each other's faces, you would know that the face is extremely sensitive. And we get a lot of information from touching each other's face with our hands or faces touching one another. The other parts of the body are much less well represented, although the skin is sensitive over all parts. As primates, we touch one another a lot in meaningful ways, not at all in random ways. This importance of the sense of touch, the sense of touch has been referred to as the mother of all senses by the late anthropologist Ashley Montague because it forms such an important part of our economy from the moment we are born. Infants of all primate species start to engage in very, very uh, detailed types of touching with their mother. Their mothers touch them, they touch their mothers, and the bond of motherhood, the bond of primatehood is reinforced. This is soothing to both parties, incredibly soothing and important, and is part of normal nurturance. In the early 1960s, the famous psychologist Harry Harlow did a series of experiments, to some people infamous experiments, but still highly informative ones, that attested to the importance of touch. He took tiny macaque monkeys away from their natural mothers and put them next to these two surrogate mothers. One of them was warm and soft, but had no milk. The other one was cold and made out of wire, but did have a supply of milk. The infant invariably preferred this warm, soft cloth mother and only nipped over for a few seconds or a few minutes during the day to get nourishment from this cloth mother that had milk. The sense of touch was more important. The reassurance of the warmth of this body was more important to the monkey than the nourishment of milk itself. Primates use touch to cement alliances here, a female baboon with her male partner, to get over arguments. These two chimpanzees are grooming one another after they've had an argument, an altercation, and they're trying to patch things up using a unique form of grooming called hand clasp grooming. And grooming is incredibly soothing. During a grooming episode, both animals that are participating gain a tremendous amount of relaxation. Their levels of stress hormone both decline. So it's a very satisfactory experience. Now, all of us here and those of you watching on the internet feel that you're, very, of course, very sophisticated primates, that you don't groom one another and that you're above this somehow. Well, think again, because we pay a lot for grooming, even though we may not call it such. 
here, uh, massages, spa massages or therapeutic massages are extremely popular and gaining ever more popularity. And facials uh, given by other people, usually strangers to us, are very, very popular and soothing. Things that we do to take time out of the office to reduce our tension. Now, these modalities, touch, the reassurance of touch, have been with us for a very long time. All of our close primate relatives, chimps, orangutans, down to old world monkeys, all of us share this same sensitivity, this same bonding ability through the sense of touch. This has been with us for over 40 million years since we all shared a common ancestor. That's a remarkable length of time, a remarkable legacy, a remarkable thing to ignore or discard. Now, the other thing that you may have noticed when you were looking at one another, and I hope you studied each other intently, you may have noticed some difference in each other's skin color. Because one of the other remarkable things about human skin is that it comes in a natural range of interesting colors, from very light to very dark. And this is not randomly distributed over the Earth's surface. We know that we find more darkly pigmented peoples closer to the equator, more lightly pigmented peoples closer to the poles. What does that mean? Why? Why did this evolve? Well, we have this wonderful pigment in our skin called melanin, and melanin sits in the skin, and we have different amounts of melanin in different levels of pigmented skin. And those amounts of melanin are related primarily to the amount of ultraviolet radiation in which our ancestors may have lived. If they lived in these hot pink areas where there's lots of ultraviolet radiation, the skin will be much darker. In these much grayer areas closer to the poles, the skin will be concomitantly lighter. So that we have this wonderful, wonderful distribution of deep chocolate to white chocolate. Uh, I like to think about sort of skin colors as, as flavors, and chocolate is particularly sumptuous, I think, for this description. <laughs> now, we have people living in their native environments, darkly pigmented peoples living in Africa, but also living outside of Africa in places where their ancestors never lived. Similarly, lots of lightly pigmented peoples living far distant from where their ancestors were uh, living, let's say, not in Scotland, but in northern Australia or in Kenya. Both of these peoples, these sets of peoples, experience different aspects of the environment with their skin, and to some extent are ill-suited to their new environments. This person, living at very high latitudes, actually suffers from having too much natural sunscreen, melanin sunscreen in their skin, and has a hard time producing important vitamin D in the skin. Whereas this person, very much adapted to low ultraviolet light levels, has a very difficult time living in equatorial areas where a heavy complement of natural pigment is far more adaptive and healthy. Both of these people have to consider their health when they transplant themselves to such distant lands from their homeland. Another thing that you may have noticed is that the person sitting next to you may have had some kind of decoration on them. They may have had some cosmetics or maybe even a tattoo because we decorate ourselves. Humans are self-decorating apes. And we do this <laughs> with very great intention and meaning. Cosmetics are used to highlight certain features, mostly features that are sexually attractive. Tattoos affixed for a variety of reasons, but almost always in the last several hundred years because of some truly important thing that someone wants to signify and make permanent on the surface of their bodies. Tattoos aren't done randomly, contrary to what some of you disturbed parents might think. 
tattoos are chosen with extreme deliberation and represent a much different kind of cultural statement than cosmetics. Neither of these art forms is young or recent. We know from studies of pre-classical and classical Egypt that a cosmetics industry existed there over 4,000 years ago where ground minerals and ground elements like antimony were used for eyeshadow and eyeliner, respectively. A mirror was used to help apply them in a beautiful and artistic way. And for those of you who think that the tattoos started to be developed in sailors and, and, and other uh, peripheral elements of society only a few hundred years ago, we'll think again because what you're looking at here is the skin of the famous Iceman recovered from the Tyrolean Alps several years ago. This 5,000-year-old individual had several sets of tattoos on his body, including several on his back. These probably weren't decorative. They may have been therapeutic. We will never know for certain. But humans had the technology to make tattoos over 5,000 years ago and have been making them in tremendous profusion and variety ever since, making statements, perhaps reciting therapies as they were affixed. In our skin, we have our humanity. So much of what we think about one another is in the skin that we have. Here, this man presenting his skin to you is presenting his humanity, his sense of touch, much of the things with which he identifies. Stripped of the skin, we really are all alike. So, Today, as you go about your sophisticated tasks, gathered in this room or wherever you may be watching this from, think about your skin. Think about the 40 million years of evolution that led to the skin that you have, and think about how humans, hundreds or thousands of years ago, lived with their skin and lived with one another. We, for many hundreds of thousands of years in our history, lived in groups like this, where we were in constant contact with one another. And I don't mean electronic, I mean physical contact. We looked at one another, we knew every nuance of expression, we touched one another constantly in reassurance to fondle a child, to take care of an elderly person, to hug or take care of a lover. This was an all-important aspect of the human economy, and still is. So before you insert that next emoticon, and before you use your wonderful cell phone to take a picture of somebody to send to your best friend you know, on your Flickr page, think about that. Think about how important it is to not forfeit your primateness, to think about the sense of touch, to think about all that you gain from looking at one another and touching one another and using language, conversing with one another. The depth and breadth of that bandwidth is extraordinary. And even with the most modern, sophisticated technologies, we cannot begin to do justice to it. Don't ignore 40 million years of evolution. Use all of the richness of your senses to communicate with one another and understand just how important it is to reassure one another using these ancient and well-adapted modalities. And may I say, at some point today, make sure that you do something like this because humans, like our primate relatives, need to be in touch with one another. This is truly what it means to be human. Thank you.